بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حديثك لا تنادي فهمه يا بني قومي يسودا أعيد للدنا أمجاد عصر وفل بالحديد لنا القيودا Hello everyone, this is Colin once again. I'm making this video because uh, there are two topics, as I'm sure you can tell from the title, that I'd like to cover in this video. And the reason why I'm combining both these topics in one, I, I originally was going to make two separate videos, but then I realized that both these video, or both of these potential videos, or topics rather, would be very similar in that I'm not going to be doing much talking on these subjects. I'm essentially making these videos to make people aware of both of these subjects and then I'm going to direct you all to read the articles that I have linked in the more info section which is below the uh, below uh, the screen, uh, right below my video. You'll see it there, just click on more info and then there are uh, articles for both subjects uh, and that way you can uh, read those and then uh, make decisions for yourself with regards to both these topics. Now, the first topic I'd like to mention um, is one on chapter 18 of the Quran, Surah 18, uh, ayahs, uh, let's see here, uh, specifically ayah, uh, ayah 94 to 96, and it's in reference to the building of, this, of the big iron wall. Uh, in the Quran. Uh, there's a figure in the Quran that many Muslim scholars and historians have debated whether it is Alexander the Great or whether it's per, uh, uh, Cyrus the Great or it could just be an, uh, an unknown individual but essentially this person in the Quran um, he is a uh, ruler of, an em of a great empire that extends um, you know, in uh, in, a, for, in a large geographical area, and essentially uh, he is traveling uh, across the land until he comes upon a certain area. And there's these people he he meets that are threatened by two nations, Gog and Magog. And they ask this individual for help, the king for help, and he agrees. And through the uh, the support of God Almighty, they erect this uh, wall made of made of iron. And uh, the exact verse in question that we were referring to is uh, verse 96, which says, it's a quotation, the, 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 the leader, the king is speaking, bring me blocks of iron at length when he had filled up the space between the two steep mountainsides, he said, blow with your bellows. Then when he made it red as fire, he said, bring me that I may pour over it molten lead. Thus were they made powerless to scale it or to dig through it, referring to Gog and Magog. Uh, verse 98, he said, This is a mercy for my Lord, but when the promise of my Lord comes to pass, he will make it into dust, and the promise of my Lord is true. And I had, you know, I mean, I've read this verse many times, but what's interesting is that I was going through uh, a random video, I, I forget whose video it was, and in the comments section, a critic of Islam had said, Okay, your Quran says in this chapter, in this verse, that there's supposed to be this big iron wall. Uh, and, and, and according to this, per this critic, he said, this iron wall is supposed to be around till the day of judgment. The Quran, apparently the Quran says this, will be around till the day of judgment. And that uh, if the Quran is true, then where is this big iron wall? Now, it, it's a, it, it is a great question. It's a very uh, logical question to ask. Uh, of something that is, uh, a book that is claiming to be from God makes the statement, a uh, iron wall will be there till the day of judgment, surely it must be there. And he made the uh, comparison that the Great Wall of China is still around, the pyramids of Giza are still around, so obviously this object must, you know, be in existence. Uh, if the verse is true. Now what's interesting is if you read, if you listen to what I just read, and if you actually read an English translation, or if you read any translation of it, what's fascinating is that the, the, the phrase, day of judgment, or day of resurrection, is not in the verse. Okay, it, all it says is when the day of my Lord comes, or when the, when the day of uh, let me let me quote it verbatim. At least with this, I'm reading from Abdul Yusuf Ali's translation. I don't want to misquote it. Uh, it says, and I quote, "He said, this is a mercy from my Lord, but when the promise of my Lord comes to pass, he will make it into dust, and the promise of my Lord is true." So the promise of my Lord, when the promise of my Lord comes to pass, well, what is that referring to? Well. From the text, it, it, it's it's apparently leaving leaving it up to the fact that when God, the, the wall will protect these people from Gog and Magog, and when a certain time passes, the wall will disintegrate. But it's nowhere referencing in the text itself the day of judgment. 
Now, would someone be wrong to accuse uh, Muslims of believing that this is that the promise, the promised day, is referring to the day of judgment? Uh, not necessarily, because if they read certain tafsirs, like off the top of my head, tafsir of, Jal of Al Jalaldin, I believe even the tafsir of Ibn Kathir may hint at that theory or this interpretation. But essentially, the point I'm trying to make here is that these are interpretations. Now, the question is, uh, do these tafsirs base this interpretation on the highest level of tafsir, the Quran referring to itself? Or, is, does it refer to hadiths? Are there hadiths from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, authentic narrations that say that the wall will disintegrate at the Day of Judgment, that it will be around until the Day of Judgment? And from what I, the research I've done, the answer is no. So these are uh, personal interpretations from a few scholars on this subject. Now, I did research, and I found two links I'll be posting in the description section. One is from centralmoss.com, and they've done an excellent article on the subject written by a scholar who quotes other classical scholars, who quotes classical historians, Muslim historians, who have tackled this question head-on, uh, the, the issue of the Iron Wall. And they've concluded, to summarize, that there are two theories that uh, are the, the best theories. Theory one is that the wall is not meant to be around till the day of judgment and that it is it has disintegrated and that the forces of Gog and Magog that the nations that represent Gog and Magog as the scholars understand them have done damage on the, uh, the human race in various different geographical places throughout history such as the Tartars or the Mongolians or the Seljuk Turks and things like this and that these nations still, uh, that Gog and Magog does reference uh, other uh, 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 nations as well uh, in our current current lifetime. The other theory is that the wall is in existence, but we just haven't discovered it yet. The stronger opinion of the two is that the wall has disintegrated. Now, what's fascinating is that Muslim scholars throughout the centuries were of the opinion that there is not just one wall; that this story is referring to one wall. But that, in their opinion, that there are were structures, fortresses, and walls built throughout human history that have protected civilizations against possible invaders, like the Great Wall of China is referenced by certain classical Muslim scholars and historians. So, uh, the approach of this is that, yeah, okay, we don't know where the Iron Wall is. And so the two major theories, the one being the stronger of the two, is that one is saying that it doesn't exist anymore, and that there's no textual reference to say that it would exist till the Day of Judgment, and that or that the other theory that we just haven't found it yet. And both links, one link is again to this major article on the subject, which I think settles this uh, potential uh, question once and for all. The other is just a link to uh, islamicawareness.com, or .net, excuse me, which has a host of other articles, fatwas and articles, one article from Answer Christianity is in there, that is on this very topic. And I will post both in the description section. Uh, please have a read, and then uh, you'll see the answer to this question. And therefore, if a critic comes up to you and says, your Quran says this, you can give them the very simple, straightforward answer or response of, the verse actually doesn't say anything about the Day of Judgment, or, and then on top of that, you can give them this um, scholarly academic evidence. The second topic of this video is with regards to a video that was referenced by Brother Farhan here on YouTube, and it's a video of a lecture given by Sheikh Yasser Qadi, and the topic, essentially, uh, the, the, the thesis of the lecture, and I guess it was the seminar, that, uh, and there were various scholars and, sh and, 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 and religious leaders at this uh, conference to discuss the, the topic of, uh, is Islam essentially the only path to salvation, or is this concept of all religions lead to God valid? And he discussed this from an Islamic perspective, and he did an amazing job. In fact, 99% of what he said in the lecture I utterly agree with, and I would recommend everyone to check out Brother, I will link Brother Farhan's video in the description section. You can go to his video, and from there you can see, uh, hear his video, and you can also see, get the link to the lecture itself. It's an amazing lecture. I, I would encourage everyone to, to listen to it. I have great respect for Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Uh, I own his text textbook on the sci uh, introduction to the science of the Quran, which I have utilized in, in many of my videos. Uh, with regards to tafsir, uh, abrogation, and, 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 and basically, uh, in general, how to understand the Holy Quran. Um, 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 immense respect for the, for, for, the, for the sheikh. The one thing I took exception to, this is the 1% I disagreed with, was his character uh, characterization of Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, 
uh, and Ibn Arabi, and their personal views towards this topic of, is Islam the only path to salvation, or is it actually this belief that all religions can lead to salvation? Now, this video, I'm not intending to raise the question of whether people agree with Mevlana Jalal al-Din Rumi or Ibn Arabi, whether you, how, your views about Mevlana Jalal al-Din Rumi or Ibn Arabi, to me that is irrelevant. I'm, I'm not posting this video to start a conversation about them on a personal level. So if you have your own personal feelings towards both these men, please keep them to yourself. My comment section is not the, this current video is not the place to post them. My real question in this video is very simple. Did Mivlana Jalal Din Rumi and Ibn Arabi preach and teach the idea that all religions lead to paradise, will secure your safety to heaven? Did they teach that? Now, interesting enough, in my opinion, this was the weakest part of Sheikh Yasser Qadi's um, lecture because he did not actually quote anything from Mevlana Jalal din Rumi or from Ibn Arabi himself did not cite, he did not cite any works of Mevlana Jalal din Rumi, he did not cite any works of Ibn Arabi, he simply made a generalization that both these men taught this and that this is why certain uh, minority Sufi groups uh, in the current, in our current era believe in this concept. And this is why it's uh, it's also apparently this teaching has been hijacked by like you know new agers uh, who uh, teach in this sort of universal mysticism or universal uh, um, universal um, religious concept and things like this. And so the question is, did these men actually teach this? Now, if you look at their authentic statements, it is very obvious that they did not. There's a, a famous poem that is attributed to Mevlana Jalal din Rumi. Now, one thing about me is I own all of Mevlana Jalal din Rumi's works. I own scholarly works on his life and also on his poetry and his teachings. I own a 22 volume set of his Divan al-Kabir, I own his 6 volume set of his Mathnawi, I own his uh, his uh, his uh, discourses of the unseen, his, uh, his actual uh, fatwas and lectures that he gave since he was a teacher in Konya, Turkey. Uh, and essentially I, I know I own many works on, on Mevlana Jalal al-Din Rumi one thing is for certain that there is a there were many poems that were attributed to him after his death that scholars his students his son Sultan Valed knew he did not write that he did not speak and one of the poems would imply this sort of universal concept there's uh, there's some variations but the main idea of the poem is that it basically says that you know he's a Muslim a Christian a Jew a, 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 a Buddhist and it's this implication that everyone should be everything. And there's variation of the wording depending on the translation, or as Coleman Barks does, there's a variation on the text of the poem itself, and I tell you, it is a consensus that according to scholars of, the, of poetry, scholars of Rumi's poetry specifically, historians of Rumi's life, and even the words of his students and his son Sultan Valed, that he did not uh, create this poem. However, there are, of course, if anyone knows anything about Rumi's poetry, it is full of pro-Islam, obviously. Rumi was a Muslim, he was a scholar of, Hanafi, of, of the Hanafi Medheb, he was a scholar of fiqh, as, uh, and, and as I will uh, put in the description section, people's opinions of him, uh, in the cl uh, classical, other classical scholars' opinions of him are in the positive. He was a scholar, and as well as a teacher, and his poetry is full of uh, things that if you are not familiar with Islam, or if you're not a Muslim, it would go right over your head. And there are, there's a famous quatrain by Rumi where he there are two uh, quatrains uh, where Rumi, uh, and I own the book that these both are contained in, it's a book called The Quatrains of Rumi, done by uh, a sheikh um, uh, let's see here, his name Sheikh Ibrahim Gamard who did the translation, he is a Rumi scholar, uh, and these are contained in the authentic quatrains of Rumi. One quatrain reads, Flee to God's Quran, take refuge in it, there with the spirits of the prophets mer th there with the spirits of the prophets merge. The book conveys the prophet's circumstances, those fish of the pure sea of majesty. Okay? So of course there's metaphors in there, but uh, essentially there he says, Flee to God's Quran. The second quatrain, which is the most famous, 
is, quote, I am the servant of the Quran as long as I have life. I am the dust on the path of Muhammad, the chosen one. If anyone quotes anything except this from my sayings, I am quit of him and outraged by these words, end quote. Both of these are contained in the, the famous book, The Quatrains of Rumi. And these are both authentic. So, therefore, what, what doubt do we need? That uh, here we have Rumi himself saying, if anyone says that I am not a servant of the Quran, that I am not on the path of the Prophet, the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I am quit of him, I am outraged by th those sort of words. So, from his own mouth, he is saying, uh, you know, he is essentially saying that he is a Muslim, he follows Islam, and that he believes that this is correct. A famous story. Uh, on, from the biography of Rumi, a famous story of his was that he was approached by a Christian monk in Konya, and was they were talking religion, they were having a religious dialogue, and uh, Rumi was giving the monk dawah. He, you know, he was saying, you know, he was trying, you know, basically telling uh, the monk about Islam and the beauty of Islam, and the monk li was liking what he was hearing, but he just couldn't do it. He couldn't convert from Christianity to Islam. So Rumi, uh, being uh, playful with words, said to the monk, if you cannot accept then the path of, uh, of Islam, at least follow the path, uh, i.e. follow the religion of Jesus. And the, the students, his student, Rumi's students understood this as basically Rumi is saying that, okay, if you, can't, if you don't want to follow the path of Muhammad, at least follow the path of Jesus, i.e. be a Muslim. It was a catch-22. Be more like Jesus then. And of course, from a Muslim perspective, and of course, uh, that Jesus worshipped one God. He did not associate partners, uh, etc., etc. So it was a catch twenty two for the monk. Okay, if you don't want to be like Muhammad, be like Jesus. So you, the thing is that Rumi had uh, te uh, students of. Uh, he was very tolerant of. He was tolerant of other faiths, and we know this because he had students that were Zoroastrian, Jewish, and Christian. Uh, he had students, but there was no evidence, as far as I can see, from his written work or from his poetry, or his even his prose, or even from his lectures, his fatwas, etc., from his biography, that he was of this universal opinion that all religions will get you to paradise. He was tolerant of other faiths, because of course, as Muslims, we are to be tolerant of other people's faiths. We are taught in the Quran that, uh, that, that you know, to respect the people of the book, etc., uh, that people have varying uh, religious opinions, that we are to force people to accept Islam. But, uh, the idea is that Rumi did not uh, say that yes, this you know Christianity will get you to paradise. I have not seen any evidence for this in any authentic statements of Rumi's contained in the Divan Al Kabir or in the Mithnawi or any of his other works. Now, with regards to Ibn Arabi, this is where I am not an expert. I do not own works of Ibn Arabi. I know him mainly from what I have been able to read his, some of his uh, translations of some of his works online. I know not as much about him as I know of Rumi. Now, Ibn Arabi was Ibn Arabi, though, of the opinion. Now, what's fascinating is that there is a website called livingislam.org. A, a, a sheikh uh, runs this website. He has contributing, contributing authors as well. And in this he has multiple articles in Ibn Arabi, and he even addresses the question, did Ibn Arabi preach the idea that all religions are universal and will get you to paradise, and that Islam is just one amongst a crop of many, uh, and that they're all valid? Did he actually teach this? There are actually articles on this website that address that point and refute it. Ibn Arabi, right before he died and after his death, was accused of this very same thing, and yet there are scholars that came to bat to him, uh, major scholars that said this is ridiculous, he never taught this. Um, I know that Ibn Arabi's work, when he died, people inserted their own things into his some of his books, and therefore people would read certain copies of his books, and that... Uh, innovative text would be in there, and they'd think, oh, Ibn Arabi believes this, and yet he never actually taught those things. People misunderstood Ibn Arabi, and therefore accused him of things that he actually was not teaching in reality. And so I will be posting those articles in the description section as well. So I hope, inshallah, God willing, that all this information will help everyone. Again, I, I want to make it very clear that, uh, that, that this topic is... Uh, that I want, again, I want to make this very clear that I agreed with 99% of what Sheikh uh, Yasser Qadi said in his lecture. I, I do 
uh, I do wholeheartedly, of course, agree with the with the orthodox Islamic position that Islam is the only religion that was taught from uh, from God to mankind, and that as the Quran clearly says, this is His religion. This is the religion that will, that was given to man to worship the Creator. Uh, and we are to respect other religions, but no, you are. We, we, we and of course, Sheikh Yasser Khadi was very clear, and I agree with the, agree with him on this point as well. That man is not God, a stuff for Allah. That uh, we are not divine. We are not the ultimate judge. So therefore, I cannot point to so and so and say I know that you are going to hell, a stuff for Allah. Uh, I am not God. I do. I cannot judge anyone. I do not know everyone's uh, personal condition and what they will do in the future of their lives. Or their sincere repentance that they did to between themselves and God. We are given parameters in the Quran, which is uh, what God commands us, things that He dislikes, and this is the path we are to follow. But as someone mentioned in the Q and A session of this lecture, someone asked Sheikh Yasser Khadi or brought the question about Rumi and the things Rumi had said, and Sheikh Yasser Khadi responded by saying that he would like to see, you know, he would he would appreciate to see, you know, uh, evidences or or um, further uh, texts on this topic of, of Rumi's outlook on religion. And I hope, inshallah, that this, my video, reaches him or that someone links him to this video. And I'm serious when I say this. With all due respect to him, I hope that he can see this information, hear my words uh, of both Ibn Arabi and Mevlana Jalal and Rumi, and that he can hear uh, and read their authentic opinions on this topic and not perhaps be persuaded by people who have hijacked these two great scholars uh, or essentially have uh, you know, uh, abused their texts or have uh, attributed false writings to their name. I hope, inshallah, that this will help. And again, I hope this is just another example of encouragement to take what someone says, do your own research regardless of who they are. When I make a video, I also encourage everyone to, of course, do your own research. Think for yourself. And, uh, of course, uh, we can agree with a, a lot of what we hear, but we should, of course, do research for ourselves and see the text for ourselves uh, with regards to any topic. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.